Atheist Experience, we are live. Uh, I don't even know what the date is, like the July 29th? 29th? Yeah. Something like that. I'm Matt Dull, honey, joining me this week, Claire Wilner. Hi, hey, everybody. Uh, a couple of quick announcements to get out of the way, and then uh, Claire's got a presentation. And then, as usual, we'll get to your calls because this is a live call in program uh, sponsored by the Atheist Community of Boston. We are here at the lovely Free Thought Library. And it's amazing. Now open 10 to 8 every day. Yes. You come down, look at books, hang out, play games, yeah. meet people. You know, if you're in the Austin area and you are an atheist or atheist friendly person, you're welcome to come out and join us. And after this show's over, we have dinner mm -hmm. stuff uh, right here, 1507 West Caney Lane. Um, yeah, parking's at a premium, but there's a <laughs> load true. of people here to hang out with and visit with. Yeah. Uh, other announcements, proud. September 22nd is the ACA's Bat Cruise. And as I mentioned la two weeks ago when I was on, uh, the primary guest speaker uh, is Mandisa Thomas, founder of Black Nonbelievers and many other things and wonderful person, awesome. uh, good friend of mine. I can't wait for her to come down. And yet that was not enough. The, you know, last year we sold out and right. actually had to turn people away. So tickets are available right now online. Um, and I'm not exactly, I, I think the cutoff date may be like early September when the prorated tickets stop. Ah. And then things go to a premium so those last few people can get here. But as an added incentive on the same day, not only will Mandisa give a talk and then we'll do the back cruise, uh, but I'm doing a version of my Magic and Skepticism show earlier in the day before Mandisa. So I'll do something, then we'll have a lunch break, then Mandisa will talk, then we have a dinner break, then we go out for bats, and then we go out on the town. Which for me uh, means going to the 10 o'clock show at Esther's Follies, uh, and that will sell out as well. So, you know, if you want to really hang out and make it a full weekend, you gotta, you got to start getting tickets time. now and get prepared. But anyway, this is our first time doing the show. Today. Yes, it is. It's Hi. exciting. Hi. <laughs> Claire, for those of you who don't know, uh, has been active in CFI for years. We met years ago. She's uh, been on the ACA board, helping resurrect godless bitches, uh, doing all kinds of stuff behind the scenes. And we were like, uh, yes, absolutely. Come on the show, teach us something, have fun, take calls. Right. So welcome. Yeah, thank you. This all hails from watching old episodes where caller after caller would say, question about evolution. and. Y'all would say, we're not biologists. Why are you calling us? And I was like, I'm a biologist. I can answer the questions. And so uh, this, what I'm going to do is continue my series that I started on New Year's Eve, if you're familiar. And uh, it's eight difficulties with um, evolution. And the difficulties actually means, uh, it, it hails from my husband. He comes from people who are very, very religious and, and don't get evolution. And I asked him, so what is it that stands in the way of people understanding evolution? Because to me, as a scientist, it seems pretty easy and obvious. Uh, and so he came up with eight things that stand in the way, and I'm going to address them one at a time. Uh, New Year's Eve, I did one of them, and I'm going to talk about that for just a second. But uh, what I'm going to deal with today, to start with, is... <laughs> If this is, I'm a teacher at heart, so bear with me. I'm going to use lots of examples. If this is the, the double helix of DNA, it unwinds and it essentially unzips. And the teeth are the nucleotides. Those are the, that's the, the letters that get read and turned into protein. All living things are made of protein and stuff that protein makes, like bone. And uh, we're going to talk about how DNA gets turned into an organism. And then also mutation a little bit. And we're going to cover all that in about 20 minutes. I'm going to get rid of jargon. I'm going to make this as simple as possible. If you want something more complicated, I will have resources at the end of this that you can find more information. So one of the best ways to teach is uh, let me start this up here. I'm hoping this works. Yes. Okay. Can people hear that? I don't think they're going to get the audio. They're not going to get the audio. They can't hear it at all? No. Dang it. All right. So back to me, if we could. 
Thank you. I love this. All right. So, music. Um, this is a musical score. It is not the thing that is what you hear, but it is the information that you need in order to get to the music. Um, this is a pretty good parallel for uh, how DNA gets turned into protein. You have to have the information. And in this particular thing, you've got some up on the screen behind me. There are notes, there's uh, the bars, the time signature, the instruments that are playing. All of those things go into making the entire piece. If you listen to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, it's important to listen from the beginning to the end. Otherwise, you don't feel like you've experienced it. And uh, if you do things out of order, it doesn't seem like it's Beethoven's that something's not right. But it might be still a nice piece. Um, so that change, the way things should be, um, that's where we're going to start with that. Um, I'll get more into detail with that. All righty. So um, back to the slide. I'm going to go to the next one. All right. So this T-shirt, it is kind of funny, but it's not really. The reason I do all this is because somebody who is near and dear to me, her church taught this seriously. That's how much they don't understand evolution. That's how much they deny the information that evolution provides. And so uh, that's why I do. I have fought the State Board of Education here in Texas to try to get them to teach evolution properly. And that's why I'm here on this show, because unfortunately, religion messes with science. And it, uh, uh, so I need to deal with it. Um, let me start with this, if we can go back again. One more thing. Okay. How many of you have seen this little book? It was given to me, <laughs> yes, and it's, uh, this is how far off they are. Let me read the title to you. Life. How did it get here? By evolution or by creation? That doesn't even make sense if you're a scientist. That's like saying, uh, peanut butter, what kind of tree does it grow on? Persimmon or the great oak? I mean, it's just nothing to do with anything. That Nothing really makes sense, right? So uh, just to start with, let's clear up that little problem. Uh, so uh, there is how life began from a planet that was just organic material and not nothing living was there. And then there's how the living organisms, once they came to be, how they became so, uh, how, how they came to have so many brilliant forms. So the, Matt has said this before, but I'm gonna say it here again with some pretty pictures. Abiogenesis is when you go from no life to life. That is an entirely different question from how evolution occurs. And you get this question a lot about how uh, if you, uh, evolution doesn't explain how life began. And so it seems like a stupid question, but to somebody who's religious, it's really not. Because uh, when you explain evolution, that's explaining something that God uh, to them did. Right. And then the next thing down for them is the creation of life. And so that's God and this has got to be God. And so they don't understand that evolution and abiogenesis to scientists are two entirely separate things. To them, it's just all this God. So what you're dealing with really is them having to let go of their dogma. And that's why that's so hard for them. Um, okay, dokie. Boop. Abiogenesis is not the same as evolution. Okie dokes. Um, Matt. Yes. <laughs> have you had a flu shot in the past? Yes. I have too. Uh, have you ever looked at different kinds of dogs? There's dachshunds and Afghans. Very different organisms, right? Yes. They all have 
a certain set of genes that are in their population that are different from the other critters in that population, yet they are both organisms. Uh, the fact that those two populations are different, that's evolution. The fact that you get a shot every year because the viruses evolve every year, that's evolution. It is simply a change in frequency in genes in a population. That's all it is. It's a fact. It is a fact. Now, where things get hairy is how we explain how evolution occurs. And that's where the theory comes in. I already talked about the theory on New Year's Eve. I'm not going to go into that again. But uh, evolution is a fact. OK, the eight difficulties that my husband came up with. Uh, First was the emotionally icky business. Um, I talked about that on New Year's Eve, and I'm going to cut back to that for just a second. Incredulity, what about the missing links? Infinity versus finality, the difficulty that people have with understanding the time scale. Lack of evidence, they think there's no evidence, which is ridiculous. I'm going to enjoy doing that show when we get to it. Parsimony, they think that parsimony means that God is the simplest answer. And really, evolution is the simplest answer, and I'm going to explain why. Uh, Evolution is ungodly. Well, that's tough. that's a tough one. That's a tough one, but uh, we'll get to it. Uh, and they don't understand why science is so obsessed with it. Why does it? What does it have to do with the price of tea in China? It has to do with everything in science. And then, last of all, the black box. How is it actually happening? Because it just doesn't. I can't look under the hood and see what's going on. I just don't understand it. So it can't be real. So what we're going to do is we're going to look under the hood. Uh, first, we're going to take care of a little problem that I had with the emotionally icky thing. Some people, a couple people, wisely contacted me and said that I misspoke, and they're right. Uh, I told a story about a woman at the State Board of Education press conference who yelled, my granddaddy was not an ape. And I said that it was ironic because I agreed with her. Um, I meant that I agreed with what she said as I believe she meant it. I assumed that she meant her granddaddy was not a chimpanzee or a gorilla, which not only has the element of the ick factor I talked about on New Year's Eve, but also a fundamental misunderstanding of how new species evolve. Humans did not come from gorillas or chimpanzees. So to clarify, yes, the woman's granddaddy was an ape, homo sapiens, right? But that's not what she meant, I don't think. She was implying two things. Scientists think her ancestors were gorillas, which is not correct. and Gorillas can evolve to be humans. No and no. Those are not going to work. All righty. So black box. That's the one we're going to do. How is evolution supposedly happening? Uh, first, we need to review a couple of things because, you know, I'm a teacher. Why is this not advancing? Oh, there it goes. OK. So oops, it went really far ahead. Sorry. OK. You all saw this on New Year's Eve. And yeah, it's a really crude graphic, but it gets the point across. The pink dot at the bottom is a, a living population, and time is going from the top to the bottom. Help! And then, uh, yeah, it's just going to grow. The black uh, dots are the population as it becomes extinct, and then the new pink dots are the new species that are evolving. So it happens over time, and it is constant. There is no uh, starting and stopping a different species. It is, a, um, it, it is um, continuous. So uh, yeah, somehow it's doing weird things. Sorry, folks. OK, where are we? Oh, I'm sorry. Where are we now? OK, analogies ahead. So uh, I'm going to use two big analogies. One is the music, like I talked about. And another is uh, building cars. Now, please, it's an analogy. It doesn't mean it's exact, because I know what's going to happen. Somebody's going to call up and say, well, Beethoven was God then, right? No, 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 no. It's an analogy. It's not perfect, OK? Um, so that's where we're going with that. And um, science vocabulary and definitions. Uh, everybody know that that's a cell, right? A bunch of cells, several. And the nucleus is 
the brain of the cell, so to speak. And just a little bit of vocabulary, folks, just a couple things. And then the cytoplasm is the goo that surrounds the nucleus. The cytoplasm is where all the amino acids are. And the amino acids are important because those are what comprise uh, proteins. Another important thing to know is that we actually know what this stuff looks like. When I was an undergrad, atomic theory supposed all these things based on what we knew about the behavior of chemicals. And God damn it, now we have pictures of them. Yep. That, when I first saw this, I just, I did a happy dance. This is amazing. This to me is probably the equivalent of spiritual experience right here. This was amazing. Uh, so we're talking about chemicals, a very small level. Uh, if you saw the Martian, he made water out of hydrogen and oxygen, chemical reaction, that's all it is. All of this is nothing but chemical reactions. The big chemical that we're gonna be talking about, the big molecule, I should say, is DNA, and it is comprised of four uh, nucleotides, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. Uh, that DNA codes for protein, and making protein requires assembling amino acids in a string. Okay, so here we go. The, remember that the DNA is in the nucleus, and the amino acids that we need to make protein is in, there in the cytoplasm. So the first step is that the DNA has to unzip, like I showed you before, and then a copy of that DNA is made. All right, how is that copy made? This is gonna seem really simplistic, but if this is too simplistic for you, you're not my target audience. All right, so we're gonna make a bracelet, and there are beads in the boxes there, and here's your string, and if you wanna make the bead proper, the bracelet properly, you have to put them on in the right order, so you go red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, right? And there you go. So here, if you look at the blue strand, which is a copy, that's basically your bracelet that you're making. And it's made in a particular order, all right? So again, we never thought we'd see these things when I was an undergrad, and here we go. This was another one of those almost spiritual moments when it comes to seeing something finally for real. Uh, we're inside the nucleus, remember, and that thing at the bottom there that says beginning, or begin, DNA, and end, that black strand going through the middle of there is the DNA. The beginning of the DNA is on the right and ends on the left, of course. And what's happening there is that they're building bracelets, basically. You start with the beginning of the DNA and they put the first bead on. And as you read across the DNA, you put more and more beads on until you have the whole bracelet made. I hope that makes sense. So if you look at this and see what's going on, when you make a bracelet from DNA, you're not just making one bracelet. You can see here that they're making hundreds from a single strand of DNA all at once. So when a chromosome opens up, the chemistry just goes to town. There's no line waiting. It's just and it happens very quickly. So here's another one of those pictures that's showing beginning to finish with a DNA in the middle, and it's just freaking brilliant. Right there is your, a bunch of copies. Those little hairs on there are copies of the DNA. So now you got a copy of the DNA, and it needs to get out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm so that we can do something about it because there's, there aren't any build of building blocks to make protein in the <coughs> nucleus. All right, so we've got our information and the information has been given to the copy. And here in this analogy, the conductor has the information and we're gonna go into the cytoplasm, which is the musicians and all of their experience. 
and we're going to make some music, some actual music. We're going to make some protein. Car, same thing. You've got plans for a car. You give those plans to a foreman in a, a factory, and then eventually, with lots and lots of work, with nothing more than metal and plastic, you make cars. Um, not sure what that is. All right. So the information goes out, that copy goes out into the cytoplasm. And this should look somewhat familiar because it's kind of the same thing. That orange line shows you where the copy is. That's the beginning. That's the end. Those blobs there, those are the molecule that is the interface between the DNA copy and where the protein is built. And right there, that is a protein being built. And if you look, it's just like the um, manufacture of the copy in the nucleus. You start out with a short uh, protein and it's being built onto as you go around until you have the full length protein. And then that protein, because of the molecules that it's made up of, folds into different kind of proteins. That's why even though we're all just protein, we're all sorts of different kinds of protein. The stomach is different from the skin and so forth. And that's where that comes from. All right, so how do mutations occur? This is all background just to get to mutations. All righty. Uh, we're going to use a little couple more terminal, terms in here to make things clear. Uh, you got yellow, purple, orange, and pink. Those represent adenine, cy cytosine, uh, guanine and thymine, basically, forgive me, biologists. And uh, to make it simpler, I'm going to give them numbers so that each uh, nucleotide has a corresponding number. Now, if you're going to read these nucleotides and code for 20 different amino acids, it's not going to work to have one nucleotide per amino acid. It's not going to have work to have two nucleotides per amino acid. You're going to need three. So this nucleotide sequence gets read in threes, and those threes are called codons. And those codons match up to, the, the specific codons match up to the amino acids that they code for. All righty, so if you have this, these series of numbers here, I've kept it simple. These are codons. So you have a codon of ones, twos, threes, fours, et cetera. And then the last codon is different, and that's because it has to be to stop the process of making the protein. That's what's called a stop codon. So you, and that'll be important in a second here. So mutation can occur when one nucleotide gets switched out. And that means instead of 444, you have 443 you're going to get a different amino acid there. And that means that the protein is going to fold differently and you have a mutation. Another possibility is uh, that when that nucleotide gets switched out, it's switched out in such a way that it shuts down production of the protein early. If you see, the 333 got turned into 343, which is our stop codon. And so we lose the tail of that protein. Another thing is to have a codon duplicated, so you have an extra 222 in there. Um, another one is to have something dropped. We lost a 444 in there. And then there's uh, mutations where series of the, um, uh, the, the string get duplicated over and over and over again. Um, so there they all are again if you're playing at home. And here's the, the final one. This is where I think mutations will make the most sense to people. If you insert a single uh, nucleotide in there that's extra, uh, you see how the 222 got split and it shifts the frame of reading for every single codon all the way down. That's really going to jack up the protein. Okie dokes. And Here's an example. On the upper left-hand side is normal hemoglobin. Bottom left is a sickle cell hemoglobin. It's actually twice the size 
that it shows there. And sickle cell anemia is a, a very serious disease. I think most people would know that. Uh, the difference between sickle cell anemia and not sickle cell anemia is a single nucleotide. One thing can change that much. Same with cystic fibrosis. Same with a uh, bunch of other diseases that I had listed, but I can't lay hands on immediately. Let me see if I can find them. Nope, don't have them. That's on my notes in the thing. So the only difference there is one amino acid, one, one amino acid switched out. All right, so this is also important. If you look at insect basal plan, my PhD is actually in entomology, so I'm always, always going to go back to bugs. Sorry. Hooray. <laughs> Hooray for bugs. Uh, the insect body plan starts out with your basic segmented worm. And what that means is that you start out with a blob of, of cells and then a, uh, a, the genes get coded over and over again. They're repeated in the segments. And then you have a modification so that every segment gets a leg. And then you have modifications where those legs become other things. And it doesn't take much to disrupt that because if you change a single uh, gene, the antennae on a fly, the Drosophila, will turn, revert back to legs. So a small mutation can make a huge difference. If you look at uh, crayfish, they're delicious, and they have lots of different doodads sticking out of them. They have antennae and mandibles and the mouth parts of various sorts and the little flippers that people uh, play with at the end of them. And every single one of those doodads sticking out of a, a crawdad, every single one of them comes from the basal plan of uh, that segmented worm with lots of legs. So really, if you take a simple tune, like a leg, so to speak, and then, I don't know if you can skip it. All right, so it's not going to work. Uh, but if you watch this guy's work, um, he uh, plays variations on the theme of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, and it becomes very ornate. Uh, so if you want to learn more about what's going on here, uh, I left out lots of details. Go to YouTube. There are three search uh, things that you can put in there to find the best videos. I looked through all sorts of videos. And these three, I think, are probably the next step if this was of interest to you. And there's Beethoven's Fifth again. All righty. All right. That's it in a nutshell. Cool. Very small nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. Now you know everything there is to know about evolution. You didn't even have to go to school and get a PhD or anything. You got it all, right? <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, no, there's yeah, mountains yeah. of stuff. And Claire will be back for more, I'm sure. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see if we get calls at all. Probably not today, because mm -hmm. we're already lines full with other stuff. Yeah. Uh, but well, as stuff fine. comes in, we can kind of address that's it fine. as we go along. Yeah, sounds good. Be fun. Awesome. And I think we lost... Did we lose our person? No, we didn't. I'm going to start off with uh, King and Juno. Thanks for waiting, and thanks for helping us with the, uh, the call test earlier. No problem. Hi, how are you? Okay. This is my third time calling in. <laughs> what do you got for us today? Um, that was an interesting talk that Claire gave, but um, anyway, let me go to my first question first, and I'll comment on her talk afterwards, okay. uh, if we have time. Okay. Uh, I got into a debate with a theist, and whenever he brought up something, I would counter with another argument, but then he brought up the fact, or not the fact, but he said that you can't use science to prove anything in history. And I couldn't think of a way to argue with him about that. I was hoping maybe you could tell me what should I say in a case like that. That's easy. Science doesn't prove anything ever. Uh, it only supports the hypothesis or refutes it. And uh, the thing about history is we can go with the information we have and you can 
support stuff the best you can, but you can't ever actually prove it. Now, there's a hell of a lot of evidence there. If you do carbon dating and the science behind it is huge, tremendous, and legitimate. And so if he feels like you can't get enough evidence to show that history well, is real... He, he doesn't think carbon dating works. Of course he doesn't. <laughs> well, so here's and, the thing. Um, here's the thing. History is sorry? a discipline that is... Uh, kind of abductive. It's let's take this information and come up with the most plausible explanation of our past. We can, you know, that we're not going to get to certainty or not even close. And it's all about how reliable are the sources and what are they, you know, do you have sources for and against all this? Yeah. You can support. Well, you, can, you, concerned. you can support the basics of history, your inferences that you're making about history, by appealing to science. You have archaeology. But the key thing is, if all he means is we can't prove anything in the past, well, first of all, as Claire pointed out, science doesn't prove things. It makes, uh, it creates the most reliable models that accurately represent the facts of reality. However, everything <laughs> is in the past. Everything. It, you, you hearing this is already in the past. And so if you do this right. thing about, oh, we can't, you know, go back in the past, we can't, then everything becomes useless and you can say nothing about anything. So it's not surprising to me that you found somebody who doesn't believe carbon dating works because um, clearly they've never studied carbon dating. Because I would be shocked if there's anyone who's actually studied carbon dating who would come to the conclusion, oh, this doesn't work. Right. We, you had a mm -hmm. caller a while back who explained it extraordinarily well with M&Ms and cookies. Yep. Do you remember that? Go back and find it. Here's the thing. Was he trying to say that the Earth is only 6,000 years old and you can't prove that it's older than that? Um, no, we, we didn't discuss that, but right. he felt that the Gospels were historical documents, and I, I tried to argue and said they... Well, if you can't use honor, science to, to do history, how's he, how's he reaching the conclusion that the Gospels are historical documents? Uh, he didn't really answer that question. Of course not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's much easier to just dismiss the evidence that's presented to you than to present evidence on behalf of your own position. And that's so unscience, it's unreal, because science goes in without any suppositions. Mm -hmm. If you come in with a supposition that God is real and, and the Bible is true and all that stuff, you're never going to get anywhere. In, in a real way, it's kind of like, so if you walk into my house, there's a light switch. And if you flip it, you won't see anything happen unless you walk back outside and you'll see that it turned on the light outside because now you're, in, you're, you're inside, you can't see what's happening. So you can flip that switch over and over again. So your friend comes over and says, hey, how do you turn this light on out on the outside of the house? And you say, ah, oh, you go inside and you flip the first switch on the left in there. So he goes in and he flips the switch and the light's on. And he says, I don't believe that. I don't believe that switch turns the light on. I think it's the magic feather in my pocket. That's essentially what you're <laughs> dealing with. And you have to say, okay, you either, you, you either are the type of person who says, I can no longer take you seriously, we can't have a conversation, or you say, all right, we now have two hypotheses, either this switch or this magic feather. How would we go about testing it? And then you develop a test to show him that he's just freaking wrong about his feather and that you're right about the switch. It's unfortunate mm -hmm. that you can't do that for everything. It's not, everything isn't as easy to demonstrate as just flipping a switch. And I think the part of the problem is that people want it to be. And when they say, oh, why is there something rather than nothing? How did evolution occur and everything else? It's much easier for them to flip a magical switch that turns God on than it is for them to actually understand. And it's, by the way, it's not just carbon dating. That is one of many radiometric datings, which overlap and confirm yes. and affirm each other. Yes, so. right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're preaching to the choir right here. <laughs> right. Well, bring, it, your job now as the choir is to go find your friend and bring him to church. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. And uh, about your talk on evolution, I thought it was very good, but it's still a little overwhelming to the average. See, I have, a, I have a degree in engineering, so I had no problem understanding what you were saying. But to an average person, it might be a little overwhelming. Sure, sure. And I think that's why people like... Kent Hovine, when you listen to them, they give very simple, quick, and dirty answers. Mm -hmm. So it, it's easier to digest him rather than um, what yeah. you gave. Even though, yeah. even though it's simpler than previous explanations I've heard, it's. I'd, I'm not saying that you you didn't do a bad, you didn't do a good job, but uh -huh. 
I no, don't it's, think it's you, a you difficult thing. A whole lot of information and. Right. To somebody who's who's in a layman, they may have a hard time accepting it. Yeah. See, there's a the thing. As since I know, and I don't know how to. Spell the, that. Yeah. I'm since sorry? I yeah, since I know everything, well, not everything, but I know a, a lot more than what I presented. Uh, boiling it down to the very smallest thing, it's that's what makes teaching challenging. And uh, mm -hmm. if you want to break it down even simpler, DNA uh, is the template. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The copy is made, it goes out into the cell, and that copy is what's read and turned into proteins. It's, it's funny because there's a, I, I get this, taking complex topics and boiling them down to where anybody can understand, it's, you know, mm -hmm. I, I would have to say w without too much arrogance, it's something I've gotten better at over the years that I've done the show, in part because I had to make it so I could understand it. I'm talking to people with different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. It is a very difficult thing. And there's a temptation. But you do it very well. Thank you. There, there's a temptation for me always to mm -hmm. cut to the chase. Because if somebody's not able, anybody who, and there's plenty of people who can't understand what Claire was talking about, and they're going to have to go out and do some legwork. But if it's somebody who's just like flat out refusing, there's always a temptation mm -hmm. for me to say, okay, how does DNA work? It's magic. <laughs> it's just a different kind of magic than the magic you're appealing to because we can actually demonstrate it and show what's happening. And the fact that you can't understand it, I realize that pretty much makes it magic to you. But there's magic that scientists actually understand and can demonstrate and can agree on and can put up for peer review and can put up for falsification. And then there's the bullshit magic that your religion is proffering, <laughs> which is that God did it and you don't have to explain it. So if you don't understand, if you can't comprehend either of them, why wouldn't you go with the one that other people clearly understand rather than the one that appeals to something that's beyond comprehension potentially? And why not go for something that's... I don't know. <laughs> why not go for something... Uh, I, I don't understand the, uh, the tendency for some people to not be curious. I, I don't get that it's at all. Laziness and well, fear. Well, I and something Carl Sagan said a long time ago. Sometimes... When young children make are really great scientists because they're very curious, but then once they pass a certain age, that curiosity gets uh, drummed out of them. Yeah, By it's school, something yeah. to do with the education system. I forget what his what. I don't. I don't know what his example is, but the one I've used repeatedly is this: uh, the fear of being called on when you don't know the answer, because if you say I don't know, you're going to be mocked, including sometimes by uh -huh. teachers, and. So that gets us to the point where I don't know, which is often the, the right answer and the best answer, uh, becomes a bad answer. And people are ter become mm -hmm. terrified of it. But anyway, I'm going to move on to some other callers, King. I appreciate your time. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Thanks for hanging out. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Yeah, I really hope we... I want to see more changes in the education system because I've watched smart kids just get the curiosity kind of drummed out of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, for fear of giving the wrong answer. Yeah, it's true. Oh. What's well, eight times three? Well, crap. Let me use it. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and if you're slightly slower about it, mm -hmm. and the thing is, uh, there are things I'm incredibly quick at, and there are things that I'm pretty much a doofus about. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it's true. Yeah, and I make mistakes all the time. Uh, so, saying I don't know. It's something you have to get used to, and once you do, it's like, okay, I, I screwed up. I don't know. Or, or give me a minute. Let me give me a minute. Let, let me, me look it up. It. Let me look it up. Let me find a thing. Yep. So that instead of me just saying, ah, here's the answer, as if there's an authority, mm -hmm. I can actually point to you right. to an explanation and, and yep. independent sources. Right. Who knew? Yep. Uh, we have Richard in Los Angeles. Thanks for waiting. Hi. Thank you. I. Uh, I believe that I need evidence in order to believe things. So mm -hmm. I don't believe in gods who come from a, a holy book because I don't have the evidence. However, I do speak to something that I call God. And I do it because when I do it, I seem to get help. And I don't know if that help comes from a higher part of myself or what it is. But I always do get some kind of... Uh, better way of looking at a problem. And I guess my bigger point is it seems to be that there are things that we can understand and learn about forever, such as music. I'm a musician. You can learn about the history of music, how music affects the chemicals in your brain, 
And technically, you can learn about music forever. But when I try to describe what music actually is, I could never describe what it is. It's beyond description, but yet I experience it, and, and it's very real. I, I, I kind of have to, I, I kind of see where you're going, and I get it. And, you know, as somebody who's, I mean, I'm not an expert in music, uh, but I know quite a bit. And one of the things that frustrates me is when you hear musicians talk, they'll have a jargon where they will describe something because there are aspects of music that are that are kind of ineffable that you, you're talking about where you can't really describe it clearly. So when somebody says, oh, this is a warm tone or, you know, this this sound is fuzzy, you know, I can kind of get that, uh, but it's not necessarily clear. Whereas if you say, you know, this is a, a Lydian chord or, you know, or uh, not chord, um, scale uh yeah that that is more specific so the fact that there's imprecision about this doesn't mean that music is indescribable there's plenty of ways you know yeah it's there's like an entry in the dictionary and when you say to somebody music uh it's clearly something we, are, we all have some familiarity with including for the uh best mom is deaf she still knows what music is. There are signs for, for music for deaf people. There are ways to talk about rhythm and have people feel rhythm. There are ways to talk about uh, tonality and have people experience that. And you can say music is a uh, subjectively pleasant construction of sound. And at least okay. everything about that is real. When you talk to something right. that you want to call God, my question is, if you don't know what it is, why would you call it mm -hmm. God? Why would you call it God? Just because that's a word that I grew up with in my society. Yeah, but does the God that and you're talking to map to what anybody else means by God? Possibly not, but it works for me. Okay, I'm, you, you can do that all day long. I don't know what it has to do with anything, though, because if I say um, I talk to God all the time and God is, you know, this bottle of Coke Zero, uh, which should be sponsoring me at this point, uh, <laughs> Am I talking about anything that's even similar to what other people mean when they talk about God? No. Uh, I know. I think possibly um, because I've studied some Kabbalah, and um, it seems to me that from from my understanding of it, God is something that comes before understanding. It's a creator, and then creates um, thoughts that then we receive and it it makes sense to me in a way i mean that to me is is it true the fact that the fact that there's the, looking at okay but i don't care about metaphor we're right back to the st same stuff i went down with jordan peterson the fact that you can come up with a metaphorical thing that seems important to you is independent from whether or not it's actually true right so if you like metaphor well, here's another metaphor for you yes confirmation bias you know about that so people who study snakes and lizards, uh, they map where they find them. And if you look at the distribution maps of snakes and uh, lizards, it maps really closely to highways. It's not that those snakes and lizards aren't elsewhere. It's just that it's really easy to spot a snake or a lizard when it's sitting on the, the tarmac warming itself. Sure. So, sure. How much of this is you saying, well, it works for me. I used to think that way, too, so I know how tempting it is. But, mm -hmm. uh, and I used to say, well, it works for me, but not necessarily, buddy. But Because here's the thing. That sort of thinking is uh, potentially really offensive. Uh, if you say that uh, I can manifest these good things and everything happens for a good reason and that sort of stuff, uh, what does that mean to somebody who has bad things happening to them? Uh, my mother-in-law was very concerned when she found out we were atheists. She said, what if something happens to your children? Something's going to happen to them because you're atheists. Uh, that's really ugly. And what I wanted to ask, which I never did, would because it would be really unkind of me, is, uh, okay, so why are you and dad so sick all the time? Right. Right. So if yeah, you I, feel like it, I'm not yeah. Saying I, I'm curious though, Richard, when you, I, we talked about, you know, your view of this thing that you're going to call God, mm -hmm. but somebody else wrote me today 
to, or yesterday, to basically say, hey, intuition is real and mine's 100% correct. And I didn't get around to, to replying to them to point out that intuition isn't real. Intuition is a label that we put on things our brain does that we may not completely understand. It's also something that's trainable. Sure. And it's not gonna be 100% correct for anybody. But you're talking about something very similar. God is this thing that you talk to that may or may not exist that does something for you. What does it do and how do you know it's doing it? I have no idea how it works. And I'm not saying that I, that it works all the time and it does miraculously. How, do how do you know if, me, what, it, what like does it that. do? How do you know that it ever works? What, what is it doing? Because it, it basically, and these are rather small things, but if I'm having like a very difficult time in life or an issue or something, I'll say, please God help me with this. And, and it what seems happens? that it seems that I'm, I receive some kind of, um, better way under on better understanding of something it it can work out in my mind and like I said maybe I'm just relaxing my mind and I think that's allowing the case. for a better way of thinking about something um, but again I I do believe that there's a part of this life cosmos that is understandable and then there's a the flip side of the coin which is life love essence of music, whatever you want to call it, that is just not, it doesn't have to do with reason or logic. That, that doesn't matter. Life. They're still understandable. Mm -hmm. We understand life. We understand love. We understand music. Well, I mean, we could talk about it, but... But the thing is, if we don't understand something, then we certainly can't have a good reason to believe it. And just because we can't well, put a word on something, that. just because we can't put a word on it, doesn't mean that we don't understand it. It doesn't mean that it's of something else. So if you study music and how it affects the brain, it's pretty clear how it does that. Um, there's, there's no real mystery there. It's, you can't put a word on how it affects you, but... You right. could. You could just make up yeah, a word. Yeah, you can make That's up a word. That's what we do with everything else. We right. make up a word. Up we a say word. this word is now, you know, Fergal Burgle is now the word for the feeling that you have when you listen to music. I mean, yeah. but it's the concepts that matter. And we have these concepts. We, however, when you start talking about God is something that is not understandable, which I realize you didn't say here, but it's in the notes for the call. Uh, if you don't understand it, then I don't know what justification you can have for calling it God or believing it's real or anything else. It seems to me that merely experiencing something and then saying, mm -hmm. ooh, I don't understand that experience, so I'm gonna call it this, mm -hmm. that gets you mm -hmm. nothing other than it's, it's a pacifier. It is to ease your discomfort with not understanding what your experience, you put a label on it. If you want to actually ease the discomfort, you explore what it is that you're experiencing and figure out what it is. Oh, well, I'm all for that as well, for sure. Well, the thing is, you're putting the cart before the horse. I don't know how much exploration you've done, but you've decided to label this God without the exploration that would be sufficient to show that it is a God. Until I have more information. Okay. And yeah, maybe I'm saying that which I don't understand. But if you label it and you and you just say I'm going to call it God until I know different. Now you're engaged in a fallacy. It's a it's the argument. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Wow, my brain just completely shut down there. Uh, um, wow. Because I wanted to go for an argument from incredulity, but it's, it's essentially it's uh, an argument from ignorance that you're going to hold this position because it hasn't been proved wrong. That's argument from ignorance. And so this is why I caution people against labeling something before you know what it is, because that if you label it, it pretty much stops you from looking, and there's no good reason to put a label that is used for other things as well onto something. If you don't know what the cause of this is, it would be like saying, you know what, mm -hmm. there's a dead body in the room, and I don't know who did it, but until we actually do the investigation, I'm going to go with the butler did it. That's how, that's how absurd it is to say, I experienced something, and until I know what it is, I'm going to call it God. Those are functionally identical. Yeah, maybe and, God has too many other ideas attached to the word then. And every time somebody like you says, I experienced in something and I call it God, all you do is lend credence to everybody else who thinks that and everybody else who has a different connotation of God. So every time that somebody mm -hmm. uh, says, you know, until we get a better suspect, we're going to go with the butler, all that does is disparage butlers across the planet to making them look like they're criminals. 
and it makes police more likely to point their guns at butlers. And if you want to come out from a, yes. sorry, if you want to come at it from a scientific point of view, uh, uh, talk about losing thoughts. I just. Uh, blah, blah, blah. If you want to come at it from a scientific yeah. point of view. Yeah. Well, what was I going to say about it? Um, well, statistically speaking, uh, random does not mean happening at regular intervals. It means that suddenly lots of good shit happens and suddenly lots of bad shit happens here and there. And mm -hmm. so if you attribute the good times or the bad times, like I must be really off my game because all this bad shit's happening, it's just statistically likely to happen that way. Great example that I heard yesterday. Um, we're, we're really bad at recognizing random. And it may be the, oh, yeah. That's that may be so, the fact that there's yeah. no randomness mm -hmm. at all. In fact, there may just be patterns that we don't see. But we are such pattern mm -hmm. recognition machines that when Apple came up with a randomizer for their iTunes playlist, they started getting feedback from tons and tons and tons of customers saying, hey, your randomizer sucks because it played three songs from this same album and then it played three songs from another album. That's exactly what mm -hmm. you'd expect for random if you understood random. Mm -hmm. And so what Apple did was they rewrote the random thing so that it is actually less random, right, right. so that it feels right. more random yeah. to us. That's how bad we right. are at recognizing this stuff. And here's the other thing that's scientific that I just finally remembered, is in terms of evolution, uh, that explains everything that you're talking about fairly simply, because we are, our brains have evolved to perceive things in a certain way. We all, well, most of us experience love. We all experience things that have to do with enjoying music. And you know what? The cadences in music that move people, it's universal. There is something about certain combinations of notes that move people. If you, uh, there's a wonderful blog by Dale McGowan and it's called Unweaving the Score. And he talks about the impact that uh, the way music is written, uh, how it has an impact on the way you feel. Um, if there's a song that you really, really love and you're like, oh, it's the lyrics, it's never the lyrics. It's always the music. Okay, so. to be fair, I'm going to have to take issue with that because there's uh -uh. a reason that, that uh, you know, Bob Dylan got a Nobel Prize and it's not the music, it's the lyrics. Yeah, well, I'll tell you that. I, I have a different opinion of that. I don't know any Bob Dylan music, and I read the lyrics, and I'm like, meh. Sorry. Well, thank you so much. Bye. I should let you get to other calls. I, I love your show. It's wonderful. Thanks so much. We thank appreciate the Thank you so much you. for doing it. Yeah. All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye. It's poetry. Yes, poetry, but it's and not like... some of like... it you'll like, and some of it you won't. Okay. But I can say that you're wrong. You are you are absolutely wrong to not Objectively like Objectively wrong. Oh my god. Tangled up in blue. Uh, yeah, right. I'm sure he does some good things, but I yeah. You're breaking my heart, Claire. I'm sorry. It's all right. I, 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 uh, Beatles? Oh yeah. See, all right. Now now we're back together. See, you don't have Beatles to like everything. Beatles were freaking brilliant. Love, love me. Do. Love me do does not compare to Tangled up in blue. You're just nuts. Well, no, no, I don't think that just one song, you have to look at the spectrum of what they did and I, the context in which they did it. It was pretty amazing. I agree. And on that note, uh, so to speak, the Wrecking Crew, uh, who have been on every major music album from the 50s, 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. or, uh, everybody need go watch the documentary on Netflix on the Wrecking Crew. Just right. word to the wise. Okay. Uh, we have Brendan, thanks for waiting, in Louisville, Kentucky. I love Louisville. Hey, how are you? I'm yeah, doing well. Awesome. Yeah. I'm going to come out. Uh, I have friends in Glendale, so I come out that way on occasion. Oh, nice. So what do you got for us? Um, yeah, I, I was actually uh, browsing through YouTube the other day. I saw your show. I thought it was interesting. I was hoping you guys could help me sort out through uh, a couple of questions I had. Um, I'll be I'll be brief because I'm actually meeting a friend here, but um, I wanted to preface it by just bringing me up to speed as to where I'm at. Sure. Um, I, I grew up in a, a Christian home. Um, you know, I was taught that the Bible and the stories within it are, are literal and, um, and, and everything. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I ended up investigating into the Bible, um, because I had a, a daughter and I, I have, I've always had questions about uh, certain things, and I wanted to discover the truth about them. And uh, upon sure. researching, I I realized that 
not only was I not answering those questions or I was making excuse for excuses for them, um, that I, I couldn't take the Bible literally anymore and I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, reference it. So, um, so then I was kind of like, uh, forced to look at the question of origin, you know, at face value, um, you know, intelligent design versus, uh, evolution, the big bang, all of that stuff. And, I I began to lean towards the Big Bang and evolution just because it appeals more to like you know empirical data and, and tangible evidence and stuff. Um, but but, one but of hang, the, hang on one second, Brendan. What okay. if we, what if we didn't have any of that? What if we didn't have Big Bang cosmology? If we if we were you know 500 years in the past and we didn't have a good understanding of biology and evolution, if those weren't there, does that make the God explanation more plausible? Uh, yeah, I mean, if we didn't have a better understanding of of how we got here, then I, I would, I would probably conclude that that God would be more probable, like except, that we were all here as uh, a consequence of intelligent design. Except that's a mistake, because God, the the God explanation doesn't become more or less plausible on the basis of evidence for some other proposition. The God proposition has to have its own evidence. The God proposition, if, if we are to, to accurately assess it, is just as plausible today as it was 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and 10,000 years ago, which just is to say there is no reason to reach that, there's the insufficient evidence to reach that conclusion. And that has always been the case as far as we can tell. So the fact that we don't have an answer doesn't mean that God is more plausible. Just like if we don't know who committed the murder, that doesn't make the butler more plausible. It does, that, you know, if you found a better candidate, um, you're not going to think that the butler did it. But if you have no candidate, you still shouldn't think that the butler did it. The butler did it is a proposition that needs its own evidence. That's what I was getting at. Yeah, I mean, well, we use we use logic and reason as our, our tools, you know, to navigate through life and make decisions. And we, we choose, you know, what, what's in our minds more probable. And my, my question was, even if something is more logical or reasonable to be true, um, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right option. Because Correct. If, assuming that God, assuming that God does exist, uh, wouldn't He be beyond logic and our ability to conceptualize? No. Uh, why, why would like anything? If you, were, if you were able to create us, wouldn't He uh, be beyond logic? Why? No, why, why? If I create the Sims and the or an artificial intelligence, and they, am I beyond their comprehension? Why, why would you? Why would you think that anything could possibly be beyond comprehension, or could be in opposition to the foundations of logic? Well, just the fact that they were able to create you, you know. But yeah, but God didn't that, create logic, even if he exists. Well, if he, if, he, if he did exist, that would be the assumption he created everything. No, logic isn't something that was created. Logic is how we describe the fact that there, that things work a certain way. That God couldn't... It's like they could God build a, a create a rock so heavy that even he couldn't lift it. That's a tired little canard trying to show a logical contradiction. And modern theologians recognize uh, that this is a garbage argument because the God they're talking about isn't capable of violating logic and existing in a contradictory state they describe God as a being with maximal greatness or maximal power. So uh, you, you can't set up just an abstract logical contradiction and go, boom, there's no God. And similarly, you can't say that God or anything exists outside of the framework of logic uh, because now you are in contradiction because something would both simultaneously be coherent in the sense of there's a God that we can understand and incoherent in the sense of, oh, there's a God, but he's not bound by logic. Because if it's not bound, if it's not comprehensible, if it's not bound by logic, you can say nothing about it. Nothing. Okay, well, I mean, if, if you take, um, you know, the laws of physics, gravity, Earth, and everything, you, you, you go outside of Earth, there's things outside of Earth that we don't understand, you know, the infinity of, of space, you know, everything here has a beginning. What, what do you mean, what like, do you mean we, we don't understand? understand? There are things that we don't know, but when you talk about or things understand. that... Okay, so what? What the hell does that have to do with whether or not there's a God? The fact that there are 20, let's say there's 5 billion things that I don't know or understand. 
There's no reason to think that any of those is a god, and there's no reason to think that those, any of those five billion violate logic or are something that I would be incapable of understanding if I had sufficient information. Well, it's not just that we don't understand the infinity of space. It violates what we, all the rules that we, that we do understand. No, it doesn't. Like, how can something about... be infinite? How can something be infinite? Uh, nothing is infinite in, the, in that sense. You're infinity talking... is not a quantity, it's a description. You're talking about God of the gaps, basically. A description of quantity, right? No, it's not a description of quantity. So there's, there's well, anyway, I'm gonna let Claire go. Cause... No, 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 it's, it's the God of the gaps, because you said that 500 years ago, you would have believed in God because it was the best thing. And now that we know more, better, we don't believe that anymore. That's the God of the gaps. And as far as infinity goes and finality, that's one of the things I want to talk about. Human minds have a really hard time with that. It is true. We can't even really think about, I mean, can you really hold in your mind 10 years time? Not really. It, our brains just aren't capable of it. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And uh, so because we can't deal with infinity or finality, we turn it over to God. Why? Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it's God. It's just something we don't understand. It's that simple. Yeah, I mean, it just it just seems that no matter what worldview um, I, I contend with, they all seem to be nested in um, some degree of uncertainty. Of course. So it, it, yeah. it's hard. And, and, and aside from, uh, you know, I've... My, I've, my view I, is that you I'm can't be absolutely active. certain about anything. Right, and and I've based my my moral axiom on you know everything in Scripture and, and God my whole life, and so so you um, you think gay people really deserve to be killed? All this is it's kind of a grim realization, you know, that I can't really take the Bible um, seriously, yeah, because uh, there's you know not enough evidence. I won't go into all of that, but um, now it's like I, it's hard to it's hard to um, have a new axiom that I can nest my my morals and it's like i you know the, the major contenders obviously you know murder rape and etc i you know they're mal and say universally accepted as wrong but it's like all of the little stuff it's like what how do you yes it's hard how do you base your morals off of, it's hard know? work there's a reason people accept the lazy because god said so thing sorting through and figuring out what is going to be moral in what situation is difficult but you can, you can build a good foundation. I've given a talk on the superiority of secular morality that addresses this. Sam Harris has written a book called The Moral Landscape that begins to address this. And then you have things like secular humanism, which start with a, a foundation of, okay, look, we're all on this planet. Apparently, there's no gods that are going to intervene, so we've got to figure out how to do all this shit on our own. And then you begin with simple principles. You begin with life is generally preferable to death, health is generally preferable to sickness, um, and you work towards solutions that allow for people to not just survive, but to thrive and prosper. And then you say, okay, if we're gonna evaluate a situation, something that may be moral in one situation may be immoral. Is it immoral to break the glass on a storefront? Well, it depends. If the person next to you is having a heart attack and there's a defibrillator on the other side of the glass, then breaking that glass to get the defibrillator to revive them may be the most moral action you take. Life isn't simple. And so you have to look at motivations, you have to look at consequences of actions, you have to look at them both for yourself and for society. It's a lot of hard work. I don't think it's as nearly as difficult as many people make it out to be. And in, in the conversations about morality, tend, people tend to come up with these, well, what about this really, really weird scenario? When by and large, in your everyday life, figuring out the right thing to do, not that difficult. Yeah. And it's not just a matter of opinion or popularity, it's about what benefits us, what benefits, yeah. you know. I want to talk to you about morality because that's a big thing. Yeah, um, it's not, you're on the right track. If you're already asking questions, that's amazing. Keep going, you're doing fine. Um, and the fact that you have a child on this journey with you, I think that's for the better because the child- Well, yeah, I just, you know, yeah. I, I didn't want her growing up with, with questions and that's, that's what sparked the whole, um, journey to to truth so um, oh my gosh yeah that was i know you what? i know that that's supposed to sound awesome and you really meant well but when i hear i didn't want her to grow up with questions i'm like that's all i wanted that's, to grow up with. yeah i wanted her to, I want her to ask every massive single question, questions right? and, let's, well, you know, okay. and, be, and be willing to say to yeah but, but be able to answer them for her exactly but as parents the first thing that people should do is say uh not just i don't know but i don't know but let's go find, find out, out. 
and you find out together anything that you don't know. And now everybody's learning, and they begin to value exploration, inquiry, and discovery. Uh, and that, God, what could be better in life? Did you know that the ACA is starting up a, uh, a podcast that eventually will become one of these shows called Secular Parenting? Parenting Beyond Belief? Sweet. We've already shot a couple. Yeah, we've already shot a couple of episodes, and hopefully those will be coming out pretty soon. So we can answer. It'll be call in eventually, and we'll be able to answer all sorts of questions. It's nothing but parents and people who care about raising kids asking but questions. But you're calling it secular parenting, right? Uh, I'm sorry. How do you mean? What? What? Parenting beyond belief. Did we talk to Dale McGowan? Yeah, he's on it. Oh. He's on it. See? He, he gave us his blessing. I was he's like, on the oh, show. before we use his name, we should probably talk to yeah. Dale. Uh, yeah. To Dale. And now he's on the show. So. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's the other host. I'm just some jackass that shows up every couple weeks. but That's okay. Anyway, Brendan, I appreciate the call. And, yeah. you know, good luck. And maybe touch base with us from time to time. And let us right know yeah. how it's going. And, you know, w when you come across questions or, or things that you kind of discovered that made your transition easier. And you might also want to call in to secular parenting or right into them once they get running. Dale McGowan's got a couple of really good books. Uh, Parenting Beyond Belief is one of them, of course, and then the other one is Raising Free Thinkers. Uh, they helped me so much because I, I grew up in the North where religion wasn't a big deal. I don't care what people say, it's different in the South. I had to know about raising kids without religion here because religion is everywhere and in your face. It's in the education, it's everywhere. So, right. the books will help you a lot. Yeah, I'll have to check this out. Thanks yeah. for taking my call. Sure. Thanks. Appreciate my it. My pleasure. Yeah. Bye. Uh, oh. Morality. Yes. It's very simple if you look at it in terms of evolution. We are social animals. Oh, yeah. That's it. I mean, if you look at the way we live, <clears throat> everything has to be conducive to living socially. If you don't live socially, you're a bear. You're a solitary animal. You don't have the same rules. Nobody cares if a bear kills another bear, another bear because that's part of their social rules. They're not social yeah. rules. When I, when I say that it's easier than most people make, make of it, that's mm -hmm. the type of thing I'm talking about. But it's more complex. Just saying that we're social animals doesn't give people the tools to figure out the right thing in the right situation. It's a start. It is. Because it, it's easier than they think because we're already wired for it. We have empathy when we're infants. We have... That's the, th that's the thing I laugh at, is that people like, you, when, you, when you try to say we're wired uh, for it, and they're like, well, what about the psychopath? The psychopath thinks it's okay. Yes, and some people are miswired. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we can recognize that, just like we know when a woman uh, has a child, there's a, there's a chemical process that actually bonds them as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can watch a new mother with her baby, mm -hmm. and you can tell in a hot second whether or not that connection has taken place or yep. whether this woman's about to experience incredible postpartum depression, yep. attachment, uh, or attachment yep. disorder, things like that, you can spot that. And this is why when we talk, people are like, well, how can you possibly justify putting someone in an insane asylum? Okay. Because they are not abiding by the rules. We, we may have society. also gotten it wrong on a number of occasions, but yeah, by and sure. large, we can, as long as it's not like a single person just de facto making pronouncements, mm -hmm. We have experts take a look and decide yep. this person is a danger to themselves and others. Boom. Yep. And it doesn't make doesn't mean they're criminal in that case. So we, we have a different institution for people who are dangerous due to mental disorder. Right. And the goal is to protect them and to protect society. If somebody shows up and says they're Napoleon, we know there's an issue. Mm -hmm. May not be worth locking somebody up because uh, we don't know yet if there's danger. Why is it then that when somebody says they've heard from God? we don't begin with the same kind of default position. God told me this. Mm -hmm. Cool. You know how many times I've had family members and religious people tell me what God has told them and it never comes true? I think there's a difference between the two of them. Uh, Napoleon was an actual person. There's history. There's all sorts of documentation. With God, having it talk to yourself and thinking you talk to it, it's the brain, the way it works, you're talking to yourself. Well, I mean, okay, whether or not Napoleon, if somebody said, I'm Lord Voldemort, okay, <laughs> not a real person, right. fictional character, etc. Well, you know what I mean. Yeah, I don't, by the way, I'm not remotely saying that religious belief is mental illness. I'm not. I, I, matter of fact, I've repeatedly spoken against that. The exercise was in believability of a claim, not whether or not it's 
mental illness because it's not. Religious belief is just you're wrong. You, you have some bad information and yeah. you're wrong about it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, a couple more. Uh, and as a reminder, anybody who wants to come down who's atheist or atheist friendly, 1507 West Caney Lane, once the show's over, we'll get together for here at the Free Lot Library for food or snacks or get together or whatever you want, uh, and we'll be around. Um, we've got, I'm sorry, is it Diane? Diane. Diane, they spelled it in a strange way, unless that's actually oh, how you spell it. Because I'm a strange person, and yes, that is the way I spell it. Awesome. No I mean strange in the sense that I am unfamiliar, not that you are a strange person. But if you're happy being a strange Thanks. person, welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. I love your show. I love you. Claire, I'm an average person, and I did understand your presentation. Right and on! Yay! Good. So my problem is I'm an atheist. It's not a problem, but the problem <laughs> is I'm in a house full of theists. That's a problem. That is a problem. So I'm looking for advice to try to deal with it in my own way, which I'm very proud of being an atheist. But, Matt, I live near where you went to high school. I can the, see that. The church that my family attends was about a mile from your church. I'm not going to name the name, but um, I just really need some advice because it's it's taking its toll on me. Yeah, actually, you're probably within a mile or two of my mom and dad. Awesome. Um, they're, in a, they're in a subdivision behind that YMCA that you'll be familiar with. But Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, th this is the part where I'm, I'm both good and terrible and that I don't like necessarily giving advice because I don't know your family. So the easiest thing for me to say is this. Be yourself. Interact with your family. By the way, family is a rather curious word. And as Jen Peoples has pointed out, your family, when you act like family, I don't care if you're blood-related or not, mm -hmm. there are blood relatives of mine that I will have no interaction with, and that was primarily their doing and their choice. There are other people who are not remotely related to me who are as close or closer than family. You have to make sure that the people that are in your life care about you for who you are, not that you are bending to their will, not that you are being who their religion thinks you need to be. And if you can have conversations, have them. If you can't have conversations about these subjects, don't. My parents and I almost never talk about religion. And it's because we've had that conversation, we know where each other's at, and all it does is ruin the interactions that we're going to have. And so if I wanna have a good time with my family, which I do, um, we talk about other things, we do other things. They know what I'm doing. Uh, they're convinced I'm working for Satan and leading people to hell. And um, right, right. I, there may be nothing that I can ever do about that except to constantly confound their expectations because they still love me, they still know I'm a good person, they watch me being a good person, they watch me doing things that they think should be immoral and, uh, hey, like, Matt's uh, preaching out against God, but yet he's talking about helping the homeless and all these, you know, mm -hmm. secular humanism, which we're kind of scared of secular humanism because that's kind of like the evil atheist baby-killing morality, except that it's not because what they're really advocating for is liberty and freedom, which we support until God tells us we have to stop. We can't, you can't have too much freedom. We've got to take some stuff away. It's very, it's more difficult for them than it is for me. Um, because I'm comfortable with me. And they're either gonna be okay with me, or they're not. And as sad as I would be if my parents stopped talking to me, which has happened to other people, I would eventually be just fine and would work to make my life as good as it can be. Because right. I, I, I will say this one little thing. Um, there, I'm not gonna go into detail. There's something going on. Um, we'll just say I have a good friend who did some things and violated my trust to the point where I, I, I hated them for, for about 45 seconds. And then I realized, no matter what they've done, I'm not going to let them make me hate them. I'm gonna be better than that because hating them only hurts me. Carrying that around, it doesn't do them any damage at all. It just damages right. me. So, you know, a la Frozen, I'm going to let it go <laughs> and get on with living my life. 
And that's... I think the biggest problem that I've encountered, not necessarily my blood relatives, it's my husband's blood relatives, even though he was born and raised here in St. Charles, his family is from southern Missouri, northern Arkansas, which is... Which is where my family's from. Right. And when I go, when we do visit them down there, now that I've came out and they all know there's a huge elephant in the room, I feel rejected. And in the, I've been with my husband 30 years, and they've loved me all those years, but now it's totally different. When I get home, sadly, I feel... I feel the rejection, which puts me in a downward spiral. I meditate a lot, but and they don't confront me verbally, but one of his relatives, she'll text me things, proverbs, you know, and, and different things in text, but when we're together, she never brings it up. Yeah, it's cowardly passive aggressiveness. Yeah. It is, is a way, to, it is almost... I've dubbed it love of love abuse in the past because this happened to my wife quite a bit with some of her family members where we just love you and we want you to come back to Jesus and yet not interacting with her at all over a period of four years in any way other than that we want you to come back to Jesus thing. And oh, basically wow. what that means is we'd really like to continue loving you and be around you, but we can't until you agree with us about our magic friend in the sky. It's holding right. the relationship hostage. And you have to recognize that this is their problem, that it is their religion that is forcing them uh, into a position where they care more about it than they care about you. Now, that's well, what it's understandable one way because I've it's kind a, of helped myself with this when we're down there is I engage in conversation not about religion or my beliefs, my liberal beliefs. I just engage in just normal rhetoric or, you know, conversation and try to not let the elephant enter the room every time and be the better person. That's all you can do. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that there's anything else you can do. Yeah. It's I, a loss. I mean, you've had a loss if you feel like you've really been rejected. Especially right after I first came out, it really felt that way. And it actually made me leave my marriage for about six months. Wow. Because I felt so rejected. I was on my own for six months, but struggled greatly because I don't have an education. It was hard to, you know, keep up with the bills. So I did come home. My husband and my two sons accepted me back. But like I said, I think the huge thing is when we go down to his family's um, farm. Yeah, it's weird the way even... So you have to recognize that you are the person in the relationship who has changed and that puts the onus on you but you also have to know that it's not your fault there's not blame here something has changed and so even the, the language that you used to describe it which is perfectly normal hey my husband and my two sons they took me back no you took them back they were right. the ones who put you in a position where just because of who you are you had to leave and so i would say that you you graciously agreed to try to overlook their bigotry because you care about them and you know that this is something that was done to them, not that they don't have any malice towards you. Their minds have been poisoned by a religion that won't let them accept you. And so you took right. them back. Right. Yep. Well, thank you for taking my call, Matt, and uh, you're one of my heroes. Oh, well, thanks, Diane. Stop having heroes. Your hero just told you to stop having heroes. We will all disappoint you at some point. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's okay. I hope to come to Austin sometime and see you guys. You bet. Love and to see you. Thank, thanks, keep Claire. A, keep an eye oh, on Facebook because uh, I'll be up in St. Peter's around probably Christmas again. And, uh, well, if you need to detox for your family, we can go out and have a drink and just talk about how oh, our yeah. relatives are talking That's about. That's the way to do know, it. Whatever. Yeah. Good awesome. luck, Diane. So December? Yeah, somewhere around there. All right, babe. Have a good night. Thanks, Diane. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, calls for home. Good. It's, it's, I mean, literally, she's within like two miles of my folks, That's wild. which is uh, amazing how small the world is. All right, are you ready to tackle a difficult one? Yeah. It's not that difficult. Okay. Bob in Deep South, thanks for waiting. Hey, awesome. Great to talk to you. Thanks for taking the call. Sure. 
Awesome. Well, real quick, um, first of all, Claire, it was great hearing your talk. I apologize. I'm going to be a little bit uh, pedantic with you. Okay. Um, just two small things. I'm a physician, so it drives me nuts. Um, first of all, uh, bones are not made of protein. They're I made didn't of say that. I said... Calcium. You did. Go back, go back on the tape. You did. Okay. I said um, and the proteins thing, make uh, the bones. Including bones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I didn't say including bones. I completely, you completely glossed over the whole point of mRNA. And I know that wasn't your point, but it drove me nuts. Because it's you're not making a copy, you're making an inverted copy, which is RNA, which is what goes into the cytoplasm. And that just drove me nuts. I okay. It's you not can, DNA. I don't want to go RNA. off into the weeds. I, I feel you. I, I feel I you. That's not I didn't I, go into rRNA, pRNA, none of that stuff, because it's just yeah. going to lose people. Not what I <laughs> yeah, you notice not I didn't what I even talk about uracil, right? Going to lose people. Well, I mean, people. that's the difference between DNA and RNA. Doesn't uh, matter. But, They're going to uh, get lost. See, I'm already lost. Yeah. So, simplified. <laughs> anyway, Super simplified. Yes. All yeah. right. So, what do you, what do you, what do you have for us? It's important. Yeah. I agree. No. So, what I really want to talk about was uh, kind of the moral justification of, mora of, of abortion. Cause, Why? Because I think it's an important topic. You know, morality is the algorithm that we use to decide what's right and wrong. Yeah. And, yeah. But so, the thing is, it's not. Well, all right. Let, let me make one. Uh, let, let me make one quick. Morality is a description of how we label right and wrong. But let me make one quick thing. Uh, if if you thought that abortion was immoral, does that mean it should be illegal? I didn't call to talk about legality. And see, I have. This, I am not I, here to talk about legality. I, I understand, I, Bob. Legal, legal. Oh my God. Legal. legal. I I understand that, Bob. And I'm you telling you. Question, and, and, it. Oh my God. I understand it, Bob, and I'm telling you that whether or not it's legal is the primary question that I care about. The fact that someone may view it as immoral, I couldn't give a rat's ass. My concern is whether or not it's legal. Well, so the question is, why should it be legal if it's immoral? Okay. My question so is, I why should it be legislated? I I, well, so I, and, I, and I'll grant you that there are legal things that are, there, that are immoral. Our administration is a good example of that. And there are uh, illegal things that are moral, like the example that you gave. So. Uh, th those are two dichotomous but, but things. But the question you important asked... to have a good foundation of why the you the, say... Bob, the question you just asked, I agree. There are legal things that are immoral. There are, Im or there are moral things that are illegal. Um, but you asked, why should it be legal? Okay, everything... I didn't ask, why should it be legal? Y you asked, why should it... Oh, just now, just now. That God was... damn, can I finish my sentence, Bob? You asked, why should it be legal if it's immoral? And the question is wrong. Everything is legal until there's a reason to make it illegal. And so if the, if the so, claim is it is immoral and that is why we should make it illegal, I would point out that A, we don't merely legislate on the foundation of morality, and B, I don't think it's immoral. And now we can get to your point, the one reason you call I agree 100%, I, I agree 100% with what you're saying. I'm, I'm compl like I said, I wasn't here to debate the legality of abortion. That's what society has deemed acceptable and, and unacceptable, what you must and must not do. That's not what I called for. I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer. Um, but I do think that it's important to have a good foundation for, you do make a claim that abortion is, is moral. You no. do make that claim. No, I, my, my claim, which I literally just made right before you started talking again, <laughs> was that I do not believe that abortion is immoral. Okay, that's a valid point. Why do you not believe that abortion is immoral? Because so I, I, I don't want to make a straw man or argument. So I want to know what you feel, what, what you believe and why. Because nobody has made a compelling case for why abortion could, should be considered immoral. And I have plenty of compelling cases where the act of an abortion, abortion is the termination of a uh, non-viable pregnancy. Okay. It's a termination of a fetus. It's a termination of a fetus. It's a termination uh, of a pregnancy. No, because delivery... It is the termination of a delivery. pregnancy that happens to primarily result in the destruction of a fetus. But it is the term... I would pregnancy... It, ter abortion is the termination of a pregnancy. So is delivery. No, no, yes. That's why I said abortion yes. is the termination so of a non-viable pregnancy, and the termination of a viable pregnancy is a delivery, or C-section, which counts as a delivery. Wait, it's type of delivery. And I would agree with that. And if... If you were delivering a fetus with a realization that it, it could die of its own, I wouldn't have necessarily the problem. And that's kind of where I would say that the, per, the procedure and the morality is different. So the, I trained in, I'm, I'm a physician, and when I trained, I'm not an OB, but 20 years ago I did do OB as part of medical school. At that time, 
the abortion procedure is what's called a DNC, right. uh, dilatation and coderage. Now it's more of a DNE, a dilatation and evacuation. Both of those necessarily result in the termination of the fetus. Correct. Which may or, which may, or may not be viable. Statistically, it may be improbable, but, uh, and again, where this came from for me, no, 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 no. So, so where this came from for me is, like I said, about 20 years ago, I was a med student, did OB. Um, within about a week of each other, performed first assist uh, on two procedures. One was a DNC on a woman who had a 19-week fetus. The second was an emergency C-section in a woman that was dated to have a 22-week fetus. Actually, I know that 22 feet week fetus because I did peds the next month and actually kept up with the family. She's still alive, has some disabilities, but for, but for being 23 weeks is amazing. Um, but my point is, I, when you look at the level of development between the two, and I saw them, they are indistinguishable. And so our ability to necessarily detect viability is rough at best. Yes. And, it's rough and, and, at best. So, and so, Bob, so, Bob, no, okay, yeah, Bob, would you let me Bob, finish? No. <laughs> no, Bob, because we have two or three minutes left in the show and you're going about things that are irrelevant. Because let's imagine that you wake up and you've been kidnapped and hooked up. Yes, bad example. Okay, can I, can I get, yes, you're the Tomlinson uh, violinist example. Yeah, Judith Jarvis so Thompson. Let me, let, let me modify it. Let me, so let's jump to it. Let me modify. Is it more, so is it acceptable? Your question is, can you disconnect the IV? My argument would be that a DNC or DNE is not disconnecting the IV. It's taking a hacksaw and chopping off the arm. No, so okay, now, now you're talking about yes. the process versus the act. And that, yes. that is... Yes, Jesus. If you, disconnect, because, if you disconnect from the violinist, the violinist will die. That is written into the scenario. Yes. You're, you are trying to talk about whether or not it's a more gruesome death. No, and and no, yes, yes, you, Bob, 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 no, Bob, no, shut no, up. No, it's active. Shut up, Bob. Listen to You're me. You're wrong, Matt. Shut up, Bob, and listen to me. You just made the distinction between disconnecting and hacking someone's arm off. That is about yes. the process and what, that, that may be the case. It may be the case that a particular process that we use for abortion may be less moral or morally inferior to another one, and that still has no bearing on whether or not an abortion is moral or immoral. Yeah, so if you are to allow a DNC or a DNE, when an option can be to, to attempt to deliver via C-section and then attempt resuscitation, if they die, they die, they don't, they don't, right? That would not be an abortion. That would be a delivery. That's nuts. I'm sorry. No, it's not nuts. That's at, no, at the no. end of the day. Matt, yeah, Matt let me ask the, you a question. No. Let me ask you a question. No. If you're falling no. from a building and you get shot in the head. No, Bob. And you've been murdered. No, this, Bob. I'm, okay. This is really frustrating because there are two men debating this. I'm sorry. This is. No, I'd love to is, hear from you, Claire. Claire, why don't, let me hear from you. you I'm getting applause because I. I, I, Matt, I don't, I'm, actually, I completely disagree. I, you Having have debated bio? this before, I'm it's sure. an everybody issue. I'm sure. I get I that. I agree, but she's, 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 she's a woman, and you and I both got penises. There you go. So, no, it's you know, not, it doesn't disqualify you. I just, I'm not getting an award edgewise. Well. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Which so, has nothing to do with the is, fact that we're men, but go ahead. Oh, yeah. 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 So my, right. my question, my question <laughs> is, so, in, if, so if, if, like I said, an abortion necessarily results in the termination of the fetus. It necessarily results in it. And the way it's performed is to necessarily result in that termination. Like I said, it's a DNC and or DNC. Those the, are your options. It kills the fetus the, or whatever it you is want to call an, it. Yeah, the fetus is actively killed not by the removal from the, the, from the placenta, not from the removal from the uterus. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is being actively killed actually prior to do being Do you know why, Bob? Now, as, as a physician, do you know why? Yes. Because that's, that's less traumatic for the woman. The, yes. That is the easiest way to do it. Yes, I because it is less it. traumatic for the woman. And but, what is wrong with that? And so being, being, being less traumatic for, exactly. So the question becomes, what is wrong with that? If you're falling off a building and you get shot in the head, have you been murdered? Yes. Yes. So, you know, the fact is that the method matters. You're talking about active versus passive. And we're talking the method about reality. This is the thing you're overlooking, Bob. The method matters because at, the, at most you're talking about two individuals with potential rights. 
Yes. But you may, so you, you, you may, you may, Bob, only be talking about one individual with rights that we have concern of. I agree 100 percent. And, and as a physician, as a I, I oh my God, as a physician, do no harm. So knowing that the fetus is almost certainly going to die under any circumstance, you take the method that results in the least amount of harm for the woman, period. That makes it the most moral action you can do. I disagree. And here's why. Here's why. Wait. I just put him on hold. You, you can go. I, I disagree that abortion is immoral. I think abortion can be moral. I, can, I think it can be the most moral thing you can do. That was my point. Right. So this whole argument to me is missing the point entirely. You're worried about how the fetus is, is ejected or whatever. I, the bodily autonomy argument is all that matters. I, you cannot require me to give a kidney to somebody who needs it. That's illegal. You couldn't do it. You wouldn't do it. How can you require me it's less painful to you. He doesn't even know he's on hold. What's less painful to me? Well, I to, know I'm on to, hold now. To have the... the, the I said um, it a while ago when you were talking. To have a, a DNC versus a, a C-section? Is that what you're saying? Well, so, what's less painful? I'm taking an IV out or hacking it off with somebody else. It may be less painful to shoot the violinist. But that doesn't change the fact that you are affecting another. Now, if you, if you don't believe that the fetus has uh, human rights, is a, is, it is, is, is a human, then- It doesn't. It doesn't. Then, it has no right. legal right. Then, then the argument has nothing to do with bodily autonomy. It's not a human. You can do whatever the hell you want with it. Then the argument is, when do you get human rights? And that's fine. No. If your no, 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 no. Because the fetus is not human. If your argument is that the fetus is not that's human- That's not what we argued. Bob, you are- you, Bob, your ass is on hold again, because you seem to be incapable of actually listening with any distinction. We did not say the fetus is not human. We said it doesn't have rights. Now, we can, in fact, grant a fetus rights. And we do, which is why- Third trimester, third trimester abortions are exceedingly rare and require incredible hurdles to overcome because we recognize that we can't draw the distinction that you want to draw, that this isn't going to be an easy little thing here uh, of saying, oh, this is viable, this is non-viable. We already recognize all that, and so we err on the side of caution incredibly, and we afford something rights despite the fact that otherwise it wouldn't have legal rights. At the end of the day, what Claire's saying, which she can say, is... Bodily rights. Bodily rights. And see, here's the thing. Having a baby, I've, I've had two. It's not just a matter of gestating and popping the thing out. It changes your body. It changes your life. It's dangerous. It can be deadly to deliver. Having a C-section is major surgery. It's not equivalent. It's, it's not okay to say that that's the way you want to go rather than aborting. That is just nuts. You're off hold. Am I off hold? Yep. I'm off hold. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. So, um, so a couple of things. So first of all, I agree with you. If you're not going to grant the fetus human rights, then honestly, bodily autonomy is a moot point. So it's not moot. There's still people, a person. Up, Jesus Christ. Damn it, Matt. Can you let me finish the sentence? <laughs> Goodbye, jackass. If, if you, if you can't, if you can't argue honestly, God bless America. This is one of those examples where people are like, why do you interrupt? And it's because if I let somebody talk for five minutes and I try to go back to the first mistake they made, then they get to clarify and talk for another five or ten minutes. Mm -hmm. I know. If I just said something like, hey, it doesn't have rights, and you reply with, oh, so you're saying the fetus isn't human, no, I have to interrupt no. and clarify that. Mm -hmm. And if he says, uh, and actually at, th at this point, I've heard, uh oh, that if you don't view the fetus as uh, something with rights, then bodily autonomy doesn't matter. No, you're just wrong independent of whether or not it has rights, independent of whether or not it is considered a person by somebody else, the whole point of Judith Jarvis Thomas's violinist argument is that here's clearly a person. This person. An adult. A person having something growing inside of them that can become another person. No, that's the other one. No, I know, but it's. The, the point of the violinist person, argument. If I'm hooked up to Claire. I don't, yeah. She's a person who has rights, and yet I have every right to remove myself from that situation. Absolutely. If you say that I don't have the right, or that she doesn't have the right, to remove herself from a fetus, you're not granting a fetus 
human rights, you're granting a fetus special rights. Yep. You are giving a fetus more rights than you are a person. Mm -hmm. And so even if you want to say the fetus doesn't have rights, that doesn't remove the issue of bodily autonomy because there's still a foreign invader inside of the woman mm -hmm. that someone is trying to grant special rights above mm -hmm. and beyond. They are valuing the rights that they are imbuing this fetus with more than they are valuing the rights and health and welfare of a living, breathing woman. Woman, specifically woman. I think if men got pregnant, this would not be an issue. Holy crap, it'd be at the 7-Eleven. Yes, be a freaking thing you could buy next to your Slurpee. I'm totally drunk last week and some chick knocked me up and now I've gotta go, yes, give me a Slurpee and plan D. Cause yeah. we, we don't wanna be on. daddy. Yeah, anti-daddy, and that's, uh, that's it. I'm sorry we're not going to get to some more calls today because we've run over time. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming in. Thank you, Claire, thank for you. teaching this us all so about biology. Fun. Yeah, trying. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Bob, for letting me call you a jackass because you were. Yeah. And uh, Trace will be on next week, I think. And there's like 19 million other shows that the ACA is now producing, including Talk <laughs> Heathen, Godless <laughs> Bitches, The Preacher <laughs> Humanist, Mr. Atheist. Uh, there's secular parenting. I think there's also a show about sex coming up yep. or whatever. Secular Don't sexuality. forget about the Bat Cruise. Go to atheist-community.org for more information in the calendar. And feel free to come down to the Free Thought Library uh, now-ish and at other times since we're open from 10 to 8. Yes. Hang out with us. Come see us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>